Hello, hello, hello. In this episode of What's the Big Idea, we're going to talk about the ability to separate the motion of a rigid body into two distinct uh, types, translational and rotational motion. And as we'll see, that is in a powerful and simplifying idea. So to get to the essence of the idea, let's uh, consider a familiar example. This uh, cartoon here uh, shows the Earth and in motion around the sun. And there are, as you know, two distinct motions uh, that the Earth can have. Um, If we focus on just the movement of the center of mass of the Earth, we see that the center of mass of the Earth is going around in orbit, uh, followed by this yellow circle here. So the center of mass motion Uh, is an elliptical orbit around the sun. Uh, But sort of superimposed on that is a rotational motion about the center of mass. So that's indicated by this white arrow here. That's rotation about the center of mass. So uh, when we say translation, loosely uh, speaking, what we mean is focusing on motion of the center of mass of the rigid body. In this case, the rigid body is the Earth. And when we say rotation, we're talking about uh, motion about the center of mass. So the Earth is uh, rotating about its center of mass, and its center of mass is translating in orbit around the sun. And what's nice about uh, separating the motion into these two distinct categories is uh, we've already shown that if you focus just on the center of mass, uh, the motion of an extended object really uh, behaves just as if it were a particle. So all the work that we've done so far in this course uh, to describe, you know, where we've assumed that our system was just a point particle, uh, that is all relevant because uh, that uh, will enable us to produce how this, if we know the forces that act on the system, we can predict from Newton's second law how the center of mass of uh, the system will move. And now, uh, rotation is the other category, and that's the topic uh, that we're focusing on now. And if you imagine that you're riding on board uh, the Earth at the center of mass, uh, viewed from the so-called center of mass frame, uh, the motion of the Earth will just appear as a pure rotation about the center of mass. Um, And one sort of concrete implication of this being able to divide things up is Let's focus specifically on the kinetic energy of the body. So the total kinetic energy of, say, the Earth in this system. We can write as a sum of what we're going to call K subtranslational, the kinetic energy associated with the motion of the center of mass of the system, plus K rotational, the kinetic energy associated with rotation about the center of mass. And we know that the translational kinetic energy, we can just write as one half times the total mass of the object, the Earth in this case, times the speed of the center of mass of the object squared. That's the translational kinetic energy. And then we can describe the rotational uh, kinetic energy. This is about the center of mass that is just going to be one half the rotational inertia of the system for a rotation about its center of mass times the angular uh, speed of the rotating object squared. Now, in general, the velocity, the speed of the center of mass, and the angular speed of rotation about the center of mass are independent of one another. Uh, And that's sort of the case here uh, in the rotating Earth. Uh, um, you know, the, the speed in orbit around the sun is a completely separate issue uh, from the rate at which the Earth is rotating uh, uh, on its axis. It orbits the sun once a year and it rotates on its axis uh, once a day. And the two, uh, no, uh, the speed of the center of mass and the angular speed of rotation uh, are unrelated to one another. Uh, in today's episode of What's the Big Idea, I'm going to focus mainly on uh, two cases in which there is a uh, very direct connection uh, between the velocity of the center of mass and the angular velocity of rotation.
So the first of these uh, two cases is the case of an object that rolls without slipping. So here's a familiar example taken uh, during the hoop race at Wellesley College, and you have a hoop that's rolling along the ground without slipping. And when you think about what happens when something rolls without slipping, it's, it's sort of a combination of a translation and rotational motion. Uh, this image over here uh, shows a disc that can roll without slipping. And there's a, a, a section on the rim of the disc that's painted red. And what we're seeing here is a, a time-lapse photograph of what that red image looks like as a, a function of time. Uh, and then there's also uh, the center here uh, which is also appearing in the time-lapse photo. And what we see is that the, the, the white center leaves this sort of orange streak behind. So the center of the wheel is just undergoing uh, a pure translational motion in a straight line. And the rim and uh, the rim of the wheel is certainly undergoing a more complicated motion. But uh, it really, view, we can view it, it turns out, as just a combination of uh, translational and rotational motion. And that is uh, an enormous simplification, as we'll see. So uh, let's try to really understand what goes on when an object rolls along the ground without slipping. So here we have uh, a view of a bicycle wheel, and we want to imagine that we're standing on the side of the road watching the bicycle go by, and the bicycle is traveling uh, from left to right, and the center of the wheel is moving at, that's where the center of mass is, COM is center of mass, and it's moving at some constant velocity to the right, V sub COM. And uh, let's imagine that we're taking sort of a snapshot of the wheel at uh, two distinct points in time in which, and they're separated in such a way that the wheel has moved uh, from left to right a distance S during that time interval. And uh, this red curve over here uh, traces out which parts of the wheel were in contact with the ground uh, during the interval between the beginning and the end. So at, the, at, at this point in time here, this was the point on the wheel that was in contact with the ground. And now, uh, you know, as, as the wheel rolled, the contact point uh, traced out this red curve along the rim of the wheel. And the, this red section here is separated through an angle theta. So theta is the angle that the wheel has rotated through uh, during the time interval between uh, the beginning and the end here. And let's uh, say that the wheel has a radius, which we'll call r. Well, then uh, by definition of the angle in radians, uh, there's a connection. The distance uh, of the arc, the arc length s uh, that is traced out over here is simply given by theta times r, right? Because by definition, theta, the angle in radians, is just the ratio of the arc length to the radius of the circle. And now let's just differentiate both sides of this equation. So we can write, therefore, that ds dt is equal to d by dt of theta times r. And ds dt we can re recognize as just the speed of the center of mass. I'm going to call it v sub cm. I'm going to leave out the o just to save writing. And on the right-hand side, r is a constant. And d theta dt is just omega the angular speed of rotation of the wheel. So what we've seen is that for an object that rolls without slipping, this all assumed that there was no slippage between the wheel and the road, that there's going to be a direct connection between uh, the velocity of the speed of the center of mass and the angular speed of rotation of the wheel. And here's an image, uh, a figure that really uh, sort of summarizes how uh, the actual motion of the wheel is really sort of a uh, combination of a pure rotation and a pure translation. So if an object were, if the bike wheel were just rotating around its center of mass at angular speed omega, uh, 
uh, then a point at the top of the rim would be moving uh, to the right, and a point at the bottom of the rim would be moving to the left. And the speed uh, at which they would be moving it turns out to be uh, the same speed as the center of mass uh, has uh, when the object is in pure translation. So in pure translational motion, um, the uh, every point on the wheel would be moving with the same velocity. And if you combine these two pictures, if you just add up the vectors here, you see that a point at the top of the wheel uh, at, at any instant in time, it's going to be moving at twice the velocity of the center of mass. If you add up what the centers of the wheel are doing, you find out that it is moving uh, to the right at the velocity of the center of mass, of course. And then instantaneously, if you look at the point that's in contact with the surface, it is actually at that moment in time stationary. So the combination of translational and rotational motion at any point in time, the point in contact with the wheel is actually instantaneously at rest. So let's see what this uh, separating uh, motion into these two distinct categories buys us. So if I've got a wheel that's rotating, that's rolling without slipping, I can write the total kinetic energy of the wheel as this sum of the translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy. And the translational kinetic energy is just one half, that we'll call the total mass of the wheel, uppercase m, times the speed of the center of mass squared. And the rotational kinetic energy is one half times the rotational inertia of the wheel rotating about its center of mass times the angular speed squared. But because the angular speed is related to the velocity of the center of mass, I can write the angular speed as V sub CM over R squared. Okay, so let's uh, take a, a specific case. Let's assume that the object that's rolling without slipping is a Wellesley hoop. And in that case, uh, we know that the rotational inertia of the hoop around its center of mass is just the mass of the hoop times the radius of the hoop squared. And then we are multiplying by V sub CM over R quantity squared. So uh, what we get then is that the total kinetic energy of the wheel that rolls without slipping, we can write as one half m times one plus one times the velocity of the center or the speed of the center of mass squared. And, and I chose to write it this way because this one here comes from the fact, you know, most of the, when you calculate uh, rotational inertias of rolling objects, uh, depending on the exact shape, uh, there's going to be a different number out in front here, but all those rotational inertias are going to be of the form of the mass, uh, some number uh, times the mass um, times the radius of the object squared. So for the hoop, that number happens to be a one, but if this were, for example, a solid disk like the one shown here, then the rotational inertia would be one half mr squared, and this one here would turn into a half. So what this argument shows is that when an object rolls without slipping, uh, there's going to be a uh, sort of division uh, between translational and, uh, 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 and rotational kinetic energy. And, uh, you know, in the case of a hoop, uh, there's sort of 50% of the uh, total kinetic energy goes into translational kinetic energy and 50% goes into rotational kinetic energy. Uh, but for other shapes uh, that roll, it's going to be a different division between translational and kinetic en uh, rotational kinetic energy. And the way in which the uh, energy is divvied up depends purely on the shape of the object. It has nothing to do with the mass or the radius, it just has to do with the shape. So that's an important idea. Okay, so the second case I'd like to consider 
uh, in which um, there's a very specific relationship between the uh, velocity of the center of mass and the angular speed or angular velocity of rotation about the center of mass is um, a case where you have a rigid body uh, such as the one that I'm trying to draw here. So imagine that I've got some sort of uh, rod that has negligible mass that's indicated by this black line and uh, attached to the rod are uh, two point masses m1 and m2 and uh, the rod uh, the center of mass of those point masses is located at a point uh, somewhere in between them a little bit closer to the bigger mass um, but the axis uh, so if you were to rotate about the center of mass the axis would be an ax uh, would be an axis uh, perpendicular uh, to the screen at this point but now we're going to imagine rotating not about that axis but by rotating about an axis which is at the end of the rod so we're going to rotate at some angular velocity omega around this axis and then uh, what can we say about uh, the um, moment of iner the rotational inertia that this object will have around this axis and how is it related to the rotational inertia that it would have if it were rotated about the center of mass. Well, to answer that question, I'm going to start with uh, this fact that we've been relying on, which is that the total uh, kinetic energy of an object can be separated into uh, kinetic energy due to its translational motion plus kinetic energy due to its rotational motion. And I can write K total as one half the rotational inertia around this, what we're going to call the parallel axis. That's this axis here, which is parallel to the axis that goes through the center of mass. So uh, one half times the rotational inertia about the parallel axis times the uh, angular speed squared. And that's equal to... Well, the translational kinetic energy I can write as one half the total mass of the system, which is m1 plus m2, times the speed of the center of mass squared. And then the rotational kinetic energy I can write as one half times the rotational inertia about the center of mass times omega squared. And here's an important point. The omega that we put in here is the same omega that we put in here. It's a subtle but important point. And to uh, explain what I mean, I want you to think about what the situation would look like in the so-called center of mass frame. The claim is that for this object going around, uh, rotating the way we've shown it, if you were in the center of mass frame, you would see these masses rotating around you at the same angular speed as this omega. So, for example, if we take a snapshot of the situation at one instant in time, uh, at this instant in time, if you're in the center of mass frame, you see the red object above you. And then if we rotate around, let's see if I can manage to do this, rotate around half a cycle, in the center of mass frame, you now see the red object below you. So it's rotated half a cycle. So I'm trying to indicate here that from the center of mass frame, you would see uh, the red and blue objects rotating around you at the same angular speed as uh, this quantity, omega. Okay, so what's the speed of the center of mass? Uh, you know, given omega, can we predict the speed of the... Uh, center of mass. Well, that's easy. If the center of mass lies a distance, which we'll call h from the axis, then the velocity of the center of mass, v sub cm, is simply omega times h. So I can rewrite my expression here as one half times the rotational inertia about the parallel axis times omega squared is equal to one half m plus m1 plus m2 let's just call that m the total mass of the system and for v center of mass squared i'm going to plug in uh, 
uh, omega h quantity squared. So that's the translational kinetic energy term. And then I have this one half i rotational inertia about the center of mass times omega squared. And uh, there's a common factor of a half in every term and omega squared in every term. So I can get rid of those and I can just write that the rotational inertia around the parallel axis is equal to mh squared plus the rotational inertia about the center of mass. And so we have just proven a very uh, useful result, which is known as the parallel axis theorem, which says that if you know the rotational inertia about an axis passing through the center of mass, and you want to find out the rotational inertia around an axis that's parallel to that center of mass axis, you don't have to do any new calculations. All you have to know is how far the parallel axis is from the center of mass and the total mass of the system. And uh, so this is an enormously useful result, as you will see uh, in a number of examples coming up. So let me just wrap up by coming back to the original picture that we showed uh, of the Earth orbiting the sun and its motion being a combination of this orbital motion around the sun, which involved its uh, center of mass motion and rotation about the center of mass. And you can imagine that the same image could almost serve as a cartoon for a hydrogen atom. So, you know, in the case of the Earth orbiting the sun, you have a gravitational interaction uh, between the sun and the Earth. In a hydrogen atom, you have a what's called a Coulomb interaction between a positively charged uh, proton in the nucleus of the hydrogen atom and an electron. Now, if you study quantum mechanics, you'll find that it is absolutely incorrect to think of a hydrogen atom as a miniature solar system. So one of the things that's really uh, strange about quantum mechanics is that you can no longer think of particles moving in specific trajectories the way this cartoon suggests. Yet, nonetheless, there are certain features of this cartoon that really translate into uh, the world of quantum mechanics. And one of those features is the uh, ability to separate things out into a kind of orbital contribution and a kind of spin or rotational contribution. So a lot of the ideas that we develop here in this classical world uh, are going to carry over uh, when you study uh, quantum mechanics. Not all of them, certainly, but some of them. And this idea of divvying up uh, energy and more specifically angular momentum into contributions uh, from an orbital component and a spin component, those are ideas which are going to be very central uh, in the study of atomic physics. Uh, so these are big ideas indeed that we have developed today. And uh, that's it for this episode of What's the Big Idea? Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.